Good afternoon. How are you? Well, let's see. I'll give you the Thomas Jefferson weather report first. It's uh, 42 degrees. <laughs> and it feels, it feels like 42 degrees. But the sky, if you can see it, is uh, totally overcast. And it just feels like it should be snow. But at 42 degrees, you don't get much snow. And uh, I suppose we'll get our, our fair share down the road. Uh, I've been doing some writing today, and it feels good when there's, you know, there's nothing else going on. But uh, we had over some young children and their parents today with pumpkins for our pigs. And uh, what we do is we break open the pumpkins. We invite people to pick up the pumpkin and throw it at the ground, and then it breaks. And then the pigs, we have 24 about now, and they put their snout inside the pumpkin, and then the, the kids can uh, pet them and, and get over any resistance they might have. These are very friendly pigs. These, these are pets. This is, uh, so we're saving pigs. So that was a lot of fun. Now, talking about the real world, there is, we hear words about peace, but it's the ephemeral, elusive conditions of peace that we can't wrap our arms around in the middle of what's called the ceasefire that still has some hostilities going on. And I put up uh, this morning a general, Israeli general, that said, well, once we get the, the hostage thing out of the way, we'll resume hostilities. But then there's also talk from our White House and from other insiders that they're going to try to work for peace. And there's two sides to that possibility. One, it could be genuine. Uh, two, it might not be genuine because maybe the Israelis are doing the same thing that Hamas is doing, which is to stall for time to position themselves for the best possible array of attacks and defenses that they can have against each other. So that's a really sad news of our situation in the Middle East. And uh, it wouldn't take a lot, uh, a lot. You know, you just sort of feel like you're in a barroom brawl on testosterone. Somebody says something, swings a punch, and the whole thing comes apart. Uh, I was once by Columbia one evening, and some guy was upset that we sat at a table. We got chairs and stuff, and they wanted to take the table back for the football team. <laughs> and uh, when the Malay started, I went and sat at a table with people I didn't know and watched the whole fight. Cops came and took away <laughs> somebody. And uh, it feel like the Middle East is sort of like uh, a multiplication of that kind of insanity. Reason is lost. Hate is paramount. We're asking people to put aside a highly emotional mantra that they can't stop repeating. And it is kill fill in the blank, kill, fill in the blank. And it's not get along. It's not forgive and forget. It's not there's some mechanism we can adopt. So I'm hopeful, but I'm skeptical. And I'd like nothing better than there be peace there. It is the demonstration of my belief since I was very young that if you want chaos, inject a combatant's of different religion to espouse their positions in contradiction of each other. I always thought the most ridiculous one was that because Henry VIII <laughs> couldn't uh, get a wife to give him a boy child, uh, and the Catholic Church, of which he was a defensor fidei, a defender of the faith, wasn't going to give him a buy on a new queen so he did what any other potentate might do, started his own religion, the Anglican religion. And then that postured against the Roman Catholic religion. And as you know, without going into detail, the royalty had Mary, Queen of Scots. So we had the distinctions between the Anglicans and the Catholics. So what is the Middle East? I'm not going to even start talking about that. What the Middle East is the same thing. And what we've seen around the world, whenever these two 
spiritual, supernatural religions with the finest scripture for making this a better world are at odds with each other and want to kill. So, it would be so amazing and wonderful if these people could come to peace. But the players don't sound like they're interested. And we have, you know, the United States and others are all trying to convince the two sides to give peace a chance. So we'll see in the days ahead. There are a couple of different things that I'm thinking about. One is I got on my high horse the other day about fentanyl. And uh, some are talking about is China going to do the right thing to help us fight illicit fentanyl? I underscore illicit because it is a drug that is used and needed and helpful to real patients. And illicit means unlawful, means not prescribed, means it's in back alleys and so forth. It's mixed with drugs, oxycodone and others, and becomes a surprise that can lead to death. So, now the precursors, think about this. If you're an investigator and you're trying to find if there's a, you know, a fentanyl lab somewhere, you would look for the precursors. That is, what do we need to make fentanyl? And uh, in recent days, there have been a couple of identifiable products that could be precursors to making fentanyl. Good. So in an investigation, if you saw these were being used and going to a place in a certain section of town near an airport or near, well, where people deposit books and things like that, things that are stored, furniture, luggage, places like that, or even a, a container near an airport or near the water. Those kinds of things. Then you say, ah, there's a good chance there's a, these guys are making fentanyl there. And then you might be able to intercept it and so forth. But what we want is China to say, we're doing something about the precursors. And I guess the, the only logical answer to that is to start imposing verification mechanisms as to the actual authorized use of these precursors. That would work. I don't think it'll be very effective myself. Because I... I, I <laughs> how, how are you going to get somebody to declare, oh, this fentanyl is for that purpose? And then you have to investigate that purpose. Is it true or not? Is it going to just be a form that one's going to stomp, stomp on? So... That's it. Uh, there's another thing in the news that uh, I find bothersome, and that is some employers are trying to get employees to sign contracts that if they leave the employee, they will reimburse the employer for a certain sum of money, presumably invested in them for that job. Now, there was... There's been also these uh, non-compete clauses that w have been overbroad, meaning I work for you, but I can't work in this region on this kind of contract with this kind of content for X years if I leave tomorrow. And there's been a lot of case law about how valid or invalid these are, given the breadth of prohibition they have for someone who signs such a, a deed, you know. The uh, Time magazine has a uh, very good piece on returning back to the, the Middle East, has a very good piece on the history. I haven't studied it. I don't know who would contest what, which is in the article, but it's very well done. And it's this Sunday's Time magazine, if you're looking for something. Now, if you're looking for an escape, that also has some value, you might think about a couple of flicks. One is very old and is sad, 
and upsetting, but uh, was very close to the facts, and it's Lawrence of Arabia. And it's a, if, if you can remember, it's a very long movie. I don't remember if it's three hours or more, but there's a, a scene in the movie that is riveting when the tribes among themselves can't agree and the tribes can only resolve what is about to be a flashpoint for the tribes to fight each other. And how is that dealt with? Lawrence of Arabia ends up shooting the alleged offender, only realizing as he volunteers to do this and looks at the person, he realizes he knows the person. And he questions him a couple of times. And then off camera, you know he's shot because you hear the shots coming as, I remember, it's pretty riveting, as Lawrence of Arabia is looking straight at his victim. And this really breaks him up. And from that movie and that fictional representation, that docudrama, you get a feeling from that scene and the movie entirely of what it's like. Now, I'm not offering this as a substitute for scholarly journals, but it was very carefully done. I think it took five years to make it. David Lean is a master at these things, and he was the director. So that's one thing. Now, if you don't want to be reminded of how difficult things are, <laughs> and if this wouldn't be a vacation from what's really serious in the world, a good movie to watch, I think, is A Million Miles Away. And what that's about is a migrant farm worker, as a child, deciding that he wants to be an astronaut. Now, I have all sorts of information in my head from the Sputnik days and afterwards, which I followed these things. And when I saw the title of the movie, A Million Miles Away, I said, that's wrong, because the moon's 238,000 miles away. <laughs> so how is it about the moon? And I think the answer is, it's a metaphor. How does a migrant farm worker become an astronaut? Goes into space. Hands that pick crops design math and forecasts for people to be launched into space. How do you cross that? That's like a million miles away. And I'll, I'll only give one glimpse. I don't think it's a spoiler. But uh, the, the hero in the movie, uh, who who's like a natural at math, he had the mind for it. This is one of these examples of can you develop the ability? And this this sticks with me a little bit because I was a Sputnik kid. That's why I went into science. My dad taught me math, and I was uh, I kind of show off <laughs> in grammar school and so forth. Uh, and I think math is one of the things that got me out of the Bronx. And this is a story of a, a boy becoming a man. And how does he move his entire family into a different place because of the gift he has? And so you'd, I think you'd find it fascinating. And the one lady he fixes on at some point because he sees her in the field when he goes out and is with his cousin. And then he goes and sees her in her office and he's interested in her, and he asks her, what does she want to be? <laughs> and uh, she says she wants to have a restaurant. Then she looks at him and says, well, you, you got to tell me what you want to do. He says, he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> Very good acting. And uh, finally says, I want to be an astronaut. And she laughs hysterically for several minutes. A great actress. And uh, then she looks at him and she says, Oh, you're serious. And she immediately supports him. So, between two movies, both docudramas, both following pretty carefully the original facts, you might enjoy it. And if not, I described two stories that you could be interested in. <laughs> so I'm out here, 
and I'm very curious to see if in the days ahead we break toward peace or more brutality and death and lies and suffering. So I say hello to you from our leafless cathedral of trees, ever the more beautiful in their new setting. Talk to you. Bye-bye.